Hello, and welcome to RYA Celebrities Guide to Getting to Know People. In this video, we're going to look at getting to know someone. We're going to explore what's the right language to use, why getting to know people is important, what is important to people about the process, what are the right questions, and how do we make a decision based on what we've learned? So first, we're going to look at the right language to use. This is a slide many of you will be familiar with. This is a slide we use in our disability awareness training. And it has lots of words written in various boxes, as you can see. And as I'm pressing the button here, crosses are appearing in words that are seen as unacceptable, and smiley faces begin to appear in words that are acceptable. Now, this slide was written by a lady called Jess Cook from the Activity Alliance. And this is the Activity Alliance take on what might be acceptable in the use of language. It provokes a lot of debate and conversation when we deliver it. We normally do it as a group discussion and people discuss this. People get worried about, are they saying the wrong thing? Are they saying the right thing in the wrong place? Can I actually say that word? Is that word OK? People get very worried about this kind of thing. And as this is normally a group activity and I can't do that with you guys, I thought, why not interview Jess Cook and we can ask her about the slide. Um, Hi Jess, tell us who you are and where you're from. Hi, my name is Jess Cook. I'm the National Partnership Advisor for the Activity Alliance, which is the national partner, um, the national quality partner for Sport England. And we're funded to help national governing bodies, community sport and leisure operators to be more inclusive and ensure that they are um, appropriately supporting disabled people into sport and activity. Thank you. Now, as you know, Jess, we use your slide in our disability awareness training, a slide that you came up with about what's politically correct and what's the correct language to use. So I wanted to yep. ask you a bit about it, really. Um, can you tell me which are the most common words, which, which are the words people get most confused about and not sure about on your slide? The thing that we, um, the slide that um, we use or the one that's in front at the moment is based on the social model of disability. Um, and the thing that a lot of people get worried about and confused by is persons with a disability and disabled people. Now, probably about 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago, when the Equality Act um, and the Disability Act first came into being, there was a lot of talk around the fact that the social model hadn't really taken off. The medical model was still being used. And there was talk about the fact that you should always put the person first. So you should have person with a disability. But when the social model came out, the social model kind of said to people, if if there was no barriers, if nobody had a disability, then we could lose the word disability and they would just be a person. So that's then why the word disabled person came up. And this was brought from disabled people for themselves. They made the decision that they wanted the word disabled pe person to be used to to describe them if they if that was needed. But ultimately, half the time you shouldn't actually say, hi, my name's Jess, I'm a disabled person. I would just say, hi, my name's Jess. And I think that that's what people are worried about. They forget the fact that there is a person behind whatever, whether you've got pink hair, blue hair, curly hair, straight hair. You're not, yeah. oh, that's Jess with curly hair. It's what well, it might be, but I'm not described that way. I'm normally described as, hi, I'm Jess. So yeah. I think that that's one of the major hang ups that we get from a lot of um, the ways that people ask questions. There's also sometimes a confusion over medical terms and the medical way that people use language. Um, and that can cause problems um, moving forward into kind of understanding what mute means and things like that, because mute and deaf dumb are, are not words that we use, but you would probably hear them in the medical um, language from doctors, nurses, practitioners, but essentially they are person without speech. So yeah. it's, it's that kind of language that we need to start thinking about, that you describe what the impairment is rather than what you think it might be. Language should always be really, really positive. It should always be a positive tone. Yes, yeah, some of the terms in here are, I remember as terms, and I know they're medical terms, but they've been used as insults in the past, and then they become negative terms. So some of the words we would have, when I was younger, people would have used were, were very negative. Yeah, absolutely. So on the list you've got there, um, there's words such as spastic. Now, the Spastic Society changed their name in the in the 80s because it was used as a very negative 
Um, the words like um, handicapped for me are massive no-no words. But if I go to the doctors or go to see a consultant or speak to somebody in the medical profession, they, on my medical notes, it will say I have a handicap. Now, the word handicap comes from the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it's when that there was no kind of welfare state, there was no support for anybody that came back with injuries or illnesses or were... Um, kind of lost limbs or suffer from PTSD as we would offer, we would um, recognise it now but they um, they used to sit on street corners with um, a cap in their hands begging for money now that was then related to people with disabilities and that's how then handicaps got picked up so it's just making sure that when we're using language we a know where that language has come from and the reason that it was first used and B, we understand what should be used now because language moves so fast and we need to be aware of that. Essentially, the best thing for you to do, if somebody, if you feel that you can't just go up to somebody and say, hi, my name's Leon, who are you? I would reply, hi, my name's Jess, that would be it. If you don't feel that you can do that and you needed to label somebody, the best thing to do is to ask them ask them what they feel is the right term to be used. But essentially, you shouldn't have to do any of that when you're in a conversation with somebody. It should be about the fact of Leon saying to Jess, how are you? How are you having a good day? Welcome to this session. And then you saying to me, okay, so what support needs do you have? What can I do to help you? What do we need to do to make this in experience better or to so you can completely um, enjoy it to the best of your ability and, and all of those things. It's about understanding the person's needs rather than getting hung up around the language you, you should be using and going, hi Jess, you have a disability. Okay, that's who you're always going to be now, Jess with a disability, because that will be the last thing I'd want. I prefer to be described as Jess with the curly hair, which I have very curly hair. So it that's the way it goes for me. That's that's how it works. But it's just about re remembering that we use as a as a, um, a a sector, we use the social model of disability. If anybody who's listening to this feels that they want to understand the social model of disability a little bit better, there's lots and lots of um, information online. But Disability Rights UK have recently done some webinars that you can listen to. They're free of charge. And there is one on social model and it does talk about um, language. So go and have a look. Just kind of do a bit of a search for Disability Rights UK and have a look at their webinar series. And it's just worth kind of if you, you're that worried about it, go check it out. But essentially speak to the person, find out what they what who they are, what they want to do and how you can support them to do that better. Cool. So what are we going to do if we think we've said the wrong thing, Jess? Don't panic absolutely do not panic if you think you've said the wrong thing and you can normally tell by somebody's facial expressions you kind of apologize just go out there and say i'm really sorry or if you get caught if they don't say anything to you then you kind of then start to listen around the language that they might use and how they might speak about their own impairment or their own self if it's something that they pull you up on you just need to go, I'm really sorry, um, please can you let me know what language you would like me to use instead. It would be the same if you swore in front of somebody, in front of your grandmother. Nobody <laughs> likes to do that. Sometimes swear it, like uh, swear words slip out and you kind of go, shouldn't have said that. But mm. actually, if you did, you go, really sorry, Nanny, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, let's move on. And that's the way it should always be. The more you fluff it, the worse you'll make it. Of course, absolutely. So if, if I had to ask you a question, Jess, and if I said, what are th the three most important things to remember about language and speaking to people? What are the three most, on top of your head, three most important things? Uh, positive language. Ask somebody um, who they are and what they're doing. And I think above all, do not panic. They're the, the top three that I would come up with. You just need to think about positive language. You just need to think about don't panic in. And if you're ever in doubt, ask. Fantastic. That is super. Thank you, Jess. You're welcome. So what's important to the people that are likely to come sailing with you? We're going to look at the Activity Alliance 10 principles here. As you know, getting to know people is a two-way conversation. You're finding out about that person and making decisions about how they can participate in sailing. They're finding out about you and what you have to offer 
and whether it's A, worth giving it a go, and B, worth coming back. So let's have a look at some of those principles. They can help us work out what's important to people when they first get in touch and when they get involved in our sport. So firstly, welcoming, most important one. People need to feel welcome to what's going on. They need to be included and part of what's happening. People need to be reassured. This is a completely new thing from coming afloat on the water. It's something very different. People need to be reassured. Is it safe? Am I going to be OK? Do people understand what's going on? As part of that process, people need you to li listen to them. To listen to me is very important. You need to listen to the participants, listen to the new sailor. Sailors also need to be included in things. They need to be included in the process. They need to be included in what's happening. They don't need to stand to one side while people are getting all the boats ready. They like to be involved. People want to be part of what's happening. And very much show people, engage people in what's happening. Show them what's happening. Show them other people with disabilities getting involved. Get people involved in your sport. Talk to me. Ten principles. For millions of people up and down the country, being active plays an important role in us staying fit and healthy. But a lot of disabled people told us that the activities are not always right for them. So with their support, we've developed 10 principles. These can help sport providers to deliver more appealing and inclusive opportunities for disabled people. So my friend Gordon can go from here to here. Principle one my channels. Like most people, I use social media and keep an eye on local groups, and I always flick to the local paper. So use the communication channels I pay attention to and trust to promote your event. Principle two, my locality. Driving halfway across town or sitting on a bus for an hour can be a big barrier for some disabled people. The closer your event is to me, in a venue I know, the more likely I am to attend. Principle three, me, not my impairment. Disability is often used as a catch-all phrase, but some people do not identify with the term and would not consider themselves to be disabled. So to reach more people, choose your words carefully in your promotions. Principle four, my values. Staying healthy, being independent and enjoying time with my friends are just some of the things I value in life. Linking your activity to things that motivate me will mean I'm more likely to get involved. Principle five, my life story. As I get older, my values and the things I enjoy changes, but I still want to stay active. Mix it up and try something new to keep me interested. <whistles> no running! Oh, come on, Rex! Principle six, reassure me. Trying a new activity can be daunting for some people. Videos, virtual tours and open days are some of the ways you can reassure disabled people that opportunities are right for them. Should we go and have a game? Yeah. Principle seven, include me. If I've made the effort to come along, I don't want to feel sidelined. Providers should make sure that people of all ability levels feel included in sessions. Nice one. Next catch wins. Principle eight, listen to me. Right, today Chris is going to introduce a new exercise, dumbbell shoulder press, which get your back straight, stomach tight. Listen to me. I feel more confident about taking part when I've had the opportunity to discuss my needs or concerns. So be approachable and offer me a time or place to talk privately. Right, here we go, Chris. Can you give me ten? Ten? I'm exhausted. Principle nine. Welcome me. You only get one chance at a first impression. A bad experience is hard to forget. So help me enjoy my time and you'll probably see me again. As we come into the next stretch, we're going to welcome Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Principle 10, show me. Nothing beats first-hand experience. So engage with disabled people already taking part in your activity to help them spread the word and promote it. These 10 principles are just the beginning, and you're probably doing some of these already. By embedding these into your work, disabled people will have access to more appealing and inclusive opportunities. Find out more about the 10 principles, visit www.activityalliance.org.uk.
So how does this relate to what we do in sailing, what we do in sailability? Why do we need to find out more about our sailors, especially if they are new to sailing? Well, if there were three questions about a sailor's needs, what could they be? I can tell what the answers might be. They might be, how can you support me? What is important to me and for me? And what do people need to appreciate about me? Why is this important? Well, so we can make good decisions about a sailor's safety and their participation. That's why we think sailability delivery principles underpin everything. We're about safe, fun and open. So what are the right questions? What do we need to know? What does a sailor need to know? Well, what do we know already? Well, a sailor, they know about themselves. They know how to communicate, how they learn. They know what they can and can't do. They know how they function and how they react. And they know about their hopes and aspirations. So as volunteers, what do we know? Well, we know about boating. And we know about the place it's going to happen. We know about the equipment we're going to be using. And we know about the people who will be supporting this activity. This is an interview with uh, Dee Bailey. She's a volunteer. Hi, can you tell me who you are? Good morning, Leon. My name is Deanne, but everybody calls me Dee. I am a volunteer at South Hangingfield Reservoir in Essex, and I have been with the club. This would be my fifth year, fifth season. We operate from April to September. Brilliant, thank you. Right. I know you're involved with Hammingfield, but can you tell me a bit about your background? What do you do for a living, Dee? I, have, or I am a supporter, support worker for a young lady with profound disabilities and brain damage. Uh, I have been with the family 16 years and that is, um, but I also have an a, a administration background, a lawyer's underwriter, office work, and I kind of got into support working um, as I was a family member, and uh, I've absolutely loved it. So how did you get sucked into sailing? How did Hammingfield get you? How did that happen? I was having lunch with my parents at the, the lovely restaurant at the reservoir, and I was watching the guys going out sailing, and I've always had a passion for the water, but never been involved. I've always been a horse rider and things like that, and I've never been involved in sailing. So I went over and introduced myself and said, would I be able to get my young lady onto a boat? Unfortunately, because of the severity of her disabilities, it's not possible at the moment. Um, and within talking to Chris and Carol and the, the, the amazing welcome I had, that was it. I was hooked. I was on the safety boat with a lovely gentleman called Jeff for the rest of the season because we were quite low on volunteers at the time. and. Um, it's changed my world. I absolutely am passionate about my sailing club. Fantastic. So what is your role at Hannyford? Do you have a specific role when you're there volunteering or do you do different things? Uh, no, I do different things. Uh, we do like to kind of mix it up a bit. Uh, I do, um, being a support worker, I do do quite a lot of hoisting. Uh, I like to greet um, New Salem's when they arrive. I make tea, I make coffee. I've got a specific question for you. You mentioned meeting and greeting and you mentioned hoisting there as well. So I want to talk to you about the first time experience of a sailor. So somebody who's new to coming to Hangfield, somebody's a brand new sailor, and you're going to meet them for the first time. What's important about when you meet that sailor for the first time? Um, I think the one thing that is incredibly important is a smile. Uh, as soon as somebody arrives, the smile will be on my face and the eye contact and good morning, how are you? So good to see you and welcome to our, our club. And I will introduce them to any of our volunteers who are close by and show them where the teas and coffees are and just, just kind of make eye contact and just be, overjoyed to see them and for them to it's a big step for some people to come to the club yeah. right. just for some people to actually walk towards us and i want to i want to greet them with the biggest smile and make them feel part of our family straight away i'll get emotional <laughs> <laughs> i think people do yes it's important stuff we do it's, it's really cool being involved in sailability 
Um, if somebody's going on the water, do you, do you have any kind of thoughts about a conversation with them? We, we talked earlier before with this interview that it's not just about the physical things you do. Do you have any thoughts on that, Do uh, Being a support worker, uh, handover is a very big part of what we do. If I hand over to another support worker, another carer, I will talk to them about what kind of day we've had, how my young lady is feeling. And I think that's also quite important when somebody comes to the club, is just talking to them um, and in talking to them and being interested in them and giving them also your full attention and you then will gauge how they're feeling if they're nervous if they're excited and smiling a lot and just just being interested in what they're saying obviously some people will arrive with their own support workers and maybe um they have a speech in you know a a speech that they don't communicate and it's just looking in their eyes and just kind of being supportive for them and encouraging fantastic do you um do you think about it before you have a conversation do you think about anything important i need to need to say before you have a conversation with somebody uh i think i will I, I think just talking to them that initial meeting them and just reading their body language uh, also, I think it's quite nice that if you are going out, I will sometimes uh, go out on uh, out with um, certain um, sailors and maybe when you're putting the life jacket on and adjusting it and making sure that they have the right clothing on the whole time you're just talking and just uh, I will just kind of one of my jobs is my lady is um, profoundly disabled and I tend to scan her um, just checking on how she's feeling. And also, if they do have a support worker or a parent or a family member, it's just learn, learning, is, 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 it, is there anything that we need to kind of know that when we're out on the water, um, anything we need to look out for? And I think that's, and that's kind of like the whole, just, just chatting, really, I think. Fantastic. Yeah, I think absolutely. Chatting is perfect. That's what we've got to do. We're communicating with people, aren't we? So, yeah, that's perfect. Now I'm going to ask you something quite specific. I'm going to ask you about hoisting, not how you hoist, but how you approach that conversation with somebody about hoisting. What do you think is the important stuff if you're about to hoist somebody for the first time? Obviously, it's all about dignity. Not all our sailors maybe would want to be hoisted if they're not hoisted in their daily lives. And it's not something we have a pontoon so as i i, I would escort the, the sailor down to the boat where the hoist is and i would be talking to them on the way down there and just kind of like gauging their reaction how they feel some people are more than happy uh with the whole hoisting i i do believe you should work as a team with your other volunteers i will listen if i am going to hoist i will and my individual can communicate I will say, how would you like me to do this? What, how can I make this work for you? How can I make this comfortable for you? And to listen to what they have to say and um, keep it lighthearted. But hoisting obviously as a support worker is very, very important. And, yeah. um, but it's listening to the individual and making sure that they they feel confident as well in yes. what you're doing. And if you have, and maybe keeping the, 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 the banter or the chit chat amongst us all, because sometimes it can be quite, everybody's chatting and trying, sometimes just keeping it, calming it down and just taking the time to listen and making sure that everybody is confident. That no, it is. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dee. I've got a final question for you. Can you give me three things off the top of your head that are important about that first conversation with a new sailor? Just three things. Smiles. Smiles. I'm smiling. And I love giving a smile back. Smiling. Um, that initial welcome to our club, making them feel comfortable and being informative. Um, I think one, they know what is exactly is happening, explaining the situation. But above all, just smiling and being happy and welcoming. It's, um, I love it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Dee. Thank you for being interviewed. You're welcome. Thank you. So how do we do this? 
How can we have a conversation so we get to know each other? What do we need to ask? What prompts will guide a conversation? There are three areas to consider. They are communication, function, and what it will be like on the water. So let's start with communication. Here are some things to consider around how a sailor may communicate and what might be important to him or her. How do I communicate? How do I engage, plan and learn? They might be worried about, they might need some help to communicate. They might need to make choices and to learn. They might need some key information in certain formats, maybe in a specific way, or they might need a communication professional to help interpret for them. What is important? What is helpful? What is useful? How I engage with others? How I develop relationships? What is important to me? What is helpful? What is unhelpful? How do you know I am listening and engaging? How will you know if I need a break? I need to know about anything on the water that may impact on my ability to communicate. You may need to tell me about the environment and possible scenarios so I can give you information that you need. Also, what is important to help me plan my day so I know what is happening next? And whether anything impacts on how I perceive risk. So next we have function. About the function I do have and the function I don't have. As a volunteer, you probably don't need to know the detail of any conditions a sailor may have. It's more important about, to know about the impact this may have when you go afloat. Here's what a sailor might need to tell you about their function. About their trunk, the control, the strength and the balance I have, and how symmetrical am I? How buoyant in the water am I? About my hands, feet and limbs. Have I got them? Can I control them? Can I feel them? Whether I can regulate my core temperature, my ability to breathe easily and maintain my heart rate, my ability to remain conscious and present at all times. My touch sensation. How do I feel or experience pain or judge extremes of temperature? Is feedback delayed in any way? My mobility, how I get about in a boat. My sensory impairments and how I process sensory information. What can I see and hear? Does anything impact on my ability to see and hear on the water? And of course, about my balance and my spatial awareness. So what do we do with this information? How do we get to a plan if a sailor's given you this information? Well, we talk to them and we come up with a plan of what we're gonna do. And some of the things we need to think about are getting familiar with the boat and all its controls, getting in and out of boats, being recovered from the water, people's mobility once they're in a boat, any equipment they might need to be safe, to feel safe if they actually go into the water. The control and steering of the sails. And how do they maintain their posture or their grip on any part of the boat? And finally, what will it be like on the water? Don't forget it's very different on the water to on the shore. People who've never been sailing before won't know what it's like out there on the water. Here are some of the things that might be important to a new sailor. How does the situation stroke environment impact on my function? Extremes of temperature, dehydration, energy levels, noise, water. Is there anything that may impact on my ability to communicate on the water? You may need to tell me about the environment and possible scenarios so I can give you the information you need. How to prevent me becoming stressed and anxious? How will you know if I'm being becoming anxious and how will you help? Do I take any medication that I may need access to while sailing, including emergency medication? You might need to tell me how long we're going to float for. Here we have an interview with Kate Healy. Kate's a sailor, and she'll tell you a little bit about it from her perspective. Right. Hi, Kate. Can you tell us your name and where you're from? Yeah, um, I'm Kate Healy, and I'm currently in Winchester, which is a bit landlocked, but never mind. No, we no, can get to the sea from there, can't you? Yeah. Um, Kate, how did you come to get involved in sailing? What happened? How oh, did you get involved in sailing? Gosh. Um, so I work for Southampton Society for the Blind, which is a local organisation to help and support people living with sight loss. Um, and because of the work that I do and the links that we have with 
the Jubilee Sailing Trust, we as an organisation were gifted a day sail um, because the majority of our demographic, so most of the people that we tend to help are the older um, generations, they don't mm -hmm. want to buy things like sailing. So I turned and I went, I'll go, I'll have a try um, on a tall ship for the first time for the day. And they said, my, you know, the CEO said, fine, you can go on board. They just grabbed me and went, well, you can, you know, you'll learn this, you do that, you know, do everything. And that can do attitude, just sort of lit the spark, lit the, you know, the, the bonfire that is now my passion for sailing. And if it wasn't for that one chance, I wouldn't be now where I am. Um, you know, I regularly train with Blind Sailing UK, yeah. uh, who are an absolutely amazing organisation. Um, your brain's about being a sailor with a visual impairment. Let's let's pick your brains about. So if somebody's new to going sailing, somebody's come to a sailability group for the first time, what do you think their concerns are going to be? Um, safety, uh, yeah. you know, key for anybody with or without a disability of any sort, knowing that you're you know, if, God forbid, you do fall in, then people are around you to help you or, you know, um, don't, communication is so key. If you can't, if you're one of your senses is reduced or missed, you know, gone, disappeared, then communication is key. For me, um, I like to be treated as, quote, normal. I'm not made of glass. I will not break. I'm not as easy as a glass anyway, let's put it that way. Um, I'm a normal human being. I still don't want to be treated any differently. Yes, safety wise, and maybe thinking out of the box of the way you teach me, but yep. I'm still, you know, I still have think feelings and thoughts, and I still, I'm a nosy person, really. I want to learn what I can learn. Yeah, absolutely. And if somebody's going to have a conversation with you, Kate, if you were new, what kind of things do you, do you want them to ask you? What's going to make you feel safer, make you feel more confident? I'm the one who deals with my disability in day in, day out. The best thing to do is ask me rather than don't ever assume because one person's opinion is different to anybody else's anyway. So how Joe Bloggs might deal with his visual impairment is totally different to how I would deal with mine. The use of language, um, the use of site guidance i have preferences how i want to be guided but it doesn't mean that it's the official way it doesn't mean that how you guide me will work for mr joe blogs over there in the corner you know it's yeah. everybody as an individual if you can gotcha what about finding out about you and wanting to know what you want to get out of sailing do people do that do you get that when you go to a sailor vertigo um, so blind sailing were brilliant and they, you know, they put me on the start, I forgot what it was, but I think my first experience with blind sailing was on a keelboat. Um, I can't even remember what it was, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. So, you know, to begin that sailing journey, you know, sat with a volunteer on board the boat. Luckily for us, it was a very, very bright sunny day in Windermere. Um, and they take begin they, we went through the book basically the very beginning of how you would start sailing and, and what was what how, what you had to consider um sink they asked about how much we could see what we could, what we thought our capabilities were what we were worried about if we were worried mm -hmm. about anything um but other places i've been have treated me i suppose more carefully and yep. You know, they've given me a two, the first ever experience, I'm not going to say where because it's not fair. I was treated to the two to one thing. So there was me and two other volunteers. Yeah. In a <laughs> That's a little bit overkill. Yes, really. I can see that. Did I get much out of it, honestly? Not hugely, no. But yeah. that's just experience. So you want to be empowered by this. You, yeah, you want yeah, people to help do, you do as yeah. much as you I can do, say. not look after you. Yeah, I don't want to be wrapped up in cotton wool. If I fall out the boat because I'm jauntily sitting on the side, not what I have yet, touch wood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to know that it's actually my fault 
and not theirs and because I've done a mistake rather than don't write back in cotton wool. I get that at some centres you have to consider, you know, other people's disabilities, fair enough. But treating everybody the same and molly coddling them is not the necessary way to go about it. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the Jubilee Centre. I feel that I'm being very mean and a bit too critical. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. No, I'm asking your opinion. I wanted to know, I want the people to learn from your experience. I mean, you mentioned the Jubilee Sailing Trust. What do they do? I know they're really good. I've sailed with them. I've seen watch leaders with visual impairments. I've sailed with people there. What do they do that's good? Is it, just, is it like blind sailing? Um, it's like that and the fact that as soon as you step on board um, or you leave the dockside you it's not the uh, your disability but it's, it's more of a can do what can you do you might be have a visual impairment or you might have a disability but they work with you to re help you realize your capabilities and your your limits but you work around that and actually you do push your own boundaries um yeah. and you know things like they have talking compasses um uh on board tenacious so that actually mid-atlantic there's nothing around you and this is you know you can do this whenever basically as long as it's safe to do so you can helm the ship yeah. and that's a crazy thought to realize that you're not really you're not in charge but for all right, say a millisecond. You are the person in your brain who's in charge of this whacking great boat. This You're definitely is... steering, that's for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's all about empowerment and and everybody working as a team. Communication is so important. Yeah. Um, because you don't, you know, I have a vision impairment. I am registered blind, but other people around me on, you know, tenacious might have had. Um, other issues that they you know ha live with ever on a day-to-day -day basis other disabilities and it's the same with blind sailing it's all about empowerment rather than oh let's take these people sailing it's get these people on the water and have a go and see how far they can push themselves and have fun learn on, learn on the way yeah definitely um you mentioned communication. Is there anything specific about communication in the kind of things people need to ask or talk about with you? Um, that's a really hard question, actually, because like I, I know I said, communication is so key, but just use of expl explaining and, and detailed language. So um, I haven't done a lot of racing, but I've done a little bit with Blind Sailing UK and the tactician really has to sort of vocalise what he, need you, he or she needs you to do there and then or coming up. So we might say tacking in three, two, one, you know, so that there's the notice that the boom's going to come above your head um, yeah. so that you don't, you know, move and whack your head on the boom. But that's from what I've actually learned when because of the current situation we've spoken to you know um people who are on um I've forgotten the name of the series of boats that they're you know foiling boats they're racing at ridiculous speeds like you know is it America's yeah. Cup it is America's Cup yeah the point of you know the fact that we use communication and counting and things so do they and that's not because we're visually that they're visually impaired that's just because that's what the best teams in the world do. Yes. So absolutely. ultimately, communication, whether you've got a disability or not, is so key to performance. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Before we go, can you give me three important things about visually impaired sailors that people need to remember as volunteers? At the top of your head, three important things. What do we need to know? Don't underestimate me. I don't want to be put in a corner. Yeah. Uh, if you're not sure, ask really i can't think of anything else really no that's fantastic that's perfect kate thank you ever so much thank you now comes a decision making process we've learned lots from talking to our sailor and we now need to make some decisions based upon this so in order to make a decision we need to consider the following we need to consider the situation where are we what's the sailing area What's the conditions of the day? What's the weather like? What's the wind like? 
What type of activity are we doing? What kind of boats and equipment are we using? We need to think about the organisation's scope of responsibility, liability and any constraints. Where are we and who else has it say in what we do or what else affects us, e.g. our insurance? When you think about our volunteers and our staff, we've got a number of volunteers and staff who are involved in helping deliver an activity. We need to consider their competence and experience. And we also need to think about the questions they have, the information they need and the training they need. Now, they need to load, load lots of things, but they don't need to know everything. So we need to balance discussing an individual's needs in a private environment and sharing information on a need to know basis. We need to think about how we share information. And it ends up with having to make a decision whether we go sailing or not. Can we meet the needs of the participants? Will the participants enjoy the session and get what they want from it? What equipment and resources are needed to deliver a safe activity? Are the staff and volunteers comfortable with the plan? Can we keep everyone safe? Both the participant and the competent person, the organization's decision maker, need to be comfortable with the decision. In conclusion, we need to think about what is important to our sailors. That's not just safety. We need to think about what we need to know. We need to ask the right questions. Between us and a sailor, we know most of the answers. We just need a conversation. And when finally, we need to make decisions based on what we learn. Finally, we have some resources to help you with this. If you want to know more about the subject, our Getting to Know You People guidance is now available. If you're thinking about the decision making process and safety, we have our safety management guidance notice. If you're thinking about disability in general, we have our disability awareness training. And we also have some other guidance around autism and boating and improving the communication environment. If you want any of this support, or any help or any of these resources, please contact your local regional disability development officer or speak to the Sailability Office. We are here to help you.